word of God. We continue our study of the letter to the Romans and we've come this morning to chapter 15 and uh, we read from verse 14 to the end of the chapter. <clears throat> Paul's desire to go to Rome and meet the Roman Christians. I myself am satisfied about you, my brethren, that you yourselves are full of goodness, filled with all knowledge, and able to instruct one another. And uh, the goodness that uh, Paul is referring to there is uh, the goodness that he's just been speaking about, the loving goodness of a Christian life in which Christian love defers to Christian liberty. And uh, that kind of loving goodness comes before knowledge. And uh, knowledge there means uh, spiritual insight or uh, spiritual discernment. And that in turn comes before the ability to instruct other people. Uh, the ability to pass on the message to others. So it's an interesting kind of uh, progression. First of all, loving goodness, and then uh, spiritual discernment, and then the ability to instruct others. But on some points, I have written to you very boldly by way of reminder, because of the special grace given to me by God, namely, that I should be a minister of Christ Jesus to the Gentiles, the outsiders. And in verse 16 here, uh, Paul uses some very special words. He's using the language of worship. Uh, the word minister there, it's the word um, liturgos, from which we get the English word liturgy, liturgos. And it means a liturgical minister of Christ Jesus. You notice in the middle of the verse, he speaks about priestly service. It's a word from worship. <clears throat> and later on in the same verse, he speaks about the offering of the Gentiles. And it's the word for the sacrificial offering on the altar. So it's very special language in verse 16. The special grace given to me by God that I should be a liturgical minister of Christ Jesus to the Gentiles in the priestly service of the gospel of God so that the sacrificial offering of the Gentiles, the outsiders, may be acceptable and uh, sanctified by the Holy Spirit. In Christ Jesus, then, I have reason to be proud of my work for God. For I will not venture to speak of anything except what Christ has done through me to win obedience from the Gentile outsiders by word and deed, by the power of signs and wonders, by the power of the Holy Spirit, so that from Jerusalem and as far round as Yugoslavia I have preached fully the gospel of Christ so making it my ambition to preach the gospel not where Christ has already been named lest I should build on another man's foundation but as it is written in Isaiah 52. They shall see 
they who have never been told of him. And they shall understand, <coughs> they who have never heard of him. <coughs> and this is the reason why I have so often been hindered from coming to you at Rome. But now, since I no longer have any room for work in these regions, and since I have longed for many years to come to you at Rome, I hope to see you in passing. As I go to Spain and to be sped on my journey there by you once I have enjoyed your company for a little. At present, however, before I come to Rome, I'm going to Jerusalem with aid for the saints. For Macedonia and Achaia, the two great provinces of Greece, have been pleased to make some contribution for the poor amongst the saints at Jerusalem. <clears throat> they were pleased to do it. And indeed, they, the Gentile Christians, are in debt to them, the Jewish Christians. For if the Gentiles have come to share in their spiritual blessings, they, the Gentiles, ought also to be of service to them, the Christian Jews, in material blessings. And therefore, when I have completed this and have delivered to them the money that has been raised, I shall go on by way of you in Rome to Spain. And I know that when I come to you, I shall come in the fullness of the blessing of Christ. I appeal to you, brothers, by our Lord Jesus Christ and by the love of the Spirit to strive together, agonizo, to agonize, to agonize with me in your prayers to God on my behalf that I may be delivered from the unbelieving Jews in Judea and that my liturgical service for Jerusalem this gift of money may be acceptable to the saints so that by God's will I may come to you with joy and be refreshed in your company. And so may the God of peace be with you all. Amen and Amen. And may the Lord add his blessing to the reading from his holy word. The key to the second half of uh, Romans uh, chapter 15 is the 29th verse where Paul says, I know that when I come to you, I shall come in the fullness of the blessing of Christ. These are very striking words. I know that when I come. Well, I wonder how Paul could have said that with uh, such assurance. Was this just a pious hope that when he came to Rome he would have good spiritual times with the Christians? Or did this I know really belong to a world of Christian certainty? Now of course we all know that there are many things in life that we cannot know for sure. We do not know 
what tomorrow will bring. We do not know for sure if we will ever live to hear the gospel preached again. We do not know precisely what the future holds for us. These are all unknowns under the providence of God. But there is also a world of Christian certainties. There are some things that we can know for sure. You can know that your sins are forgiven. You can be absolutely certain that when you die, you will go to heaven to be with Christ. You can know that here and now. You can know that you have been born again of the Spirit of God because all these I knows belong to the world of Christian certainties. And it's one of these that Paul touches on here in this 29th verse. He says, I know that when I come to you, I will come in the fullness of the blessing of Christ. Well, how could Paul know that for sure? Um, from the 14th verse uh, to the end of this chapter, we have um, many suggestions as to how Paul knew for sure. Because um, what these verses show is this. <clears throat> you have here the picture of what life is like when it is lived underneath the sovereignty of God. Paul was where God wanted him to be, doing what God wanted him to do, how God wanted him to do it. And uh, these are the three great words that you find in every Christian life that is lived underneath the sovereignty of God. Where should you be? What should you be doing? And how should you be doing it? Where, what, and how? And Paul shows us in these verses from verse 14 onwards that he was a man who was available for God in that kind of way. And to be available for God, for God's use and for God's pleasure is to live a life underneath God's sovereignty. And if you're afraid of the word sovereignty, then use the word overruling in its place. Make yourself available. Open yourself up and expose yourself to where God wants you to be and what God wants you to do and how God wants you to do it. Life lived under the overruling and the sovereignty of God. And uh, it seems to my mind that um, the keynote throughout these uh, verses is this. <coughs> If you want to live like that, be prepared for surprises. 
God will surprise you how he leads you. And God will surprise you where he puts you. Because how God leads and where God puts you are things that stand out in this great chapter. And I would like to ask you two questions before we go into this chapter. The first question is this. Are you ready to let God surprise you in how he will lead you in your life? And secondly, are you ready to let God surprise you in where you will go for him? Let's take these two in turn. First of all then, how God leads men under his sovereignty. The background to this chapter is Paul's desire to go to the capital. He longed to go to Rome. And the history is this. For 20 years, Paul had been evangelizing the Roman Empire. He'd been scouring the highways and the byways of Asia and Achaia and Macedonia for Christ. And what he was doing was this. He was pushing out the word of the gospel into the darkness and the despair and into the lostness and the hopelessness of that pagan world. And so he stravagued round the eastern end of the Mediterranean, using Antioch of Syria as his headquarters. Now, Antioch is where, roughly, where Beirut is nowadays. It was up near, it was up in Lebanon, near Tyre and Sidon. And it was in Antioch that the disciples were first called Christians. And it's interesting that it was in Antioch and not in Jerusalem that the followers of Jesus were first called Christians because the church in Antioch was a, a church with vision. It was outward looking was alive, it was evangelical, and it was a church that reached out into the darkness and pushed out into the darkness. And the Christians, the Christians there were so noticeable that they stuck up like a sore thumb and they were nicknamed the Christians, the Christ one what it means the Christ people but the church in Jerusalem was a very different story the mother church where the gospel had started had started to die the church was dying because the Christians there had become rather inward looking, legalistic, little minded, self centered, what Martin Luther called in curvatus in se, turned in upon themselves, and so the work of Christ moved away from Jerusalem, and it was in Antioch. The church with vision. The church that was alive. The church that was pushing the gospel out into the darkness. It was in Antioch that the disciples were first nicknamed Christians. And it was from Antioch that the good news of Christ moved out into the Roman Empire. You know, that is a solemn 
lesson for the churches in Scotland today. An inward looking church which does not perpetuate the gospel and which doesn't push faith of Christ into the darkness is my friend a church that is already on its way to the grave the funeral has started the hearse has begun to move the undertakers have moved in and when a church like that dies it deserves to die the church in Jerusalem died because it had no vision. The church in Antioch was a hive of evangelical life and activity and it was from Antioch that the empire was evangelized. I wonder if that's how we strike the outsiders in uh, this needy town do we stick up like a sore thumb like the Christians in Antioch what nicknames do they call us would they call us the Christ people Church with vision survives, grows, moves. Church without vision dies. So stepping out from Antioch for 20 years, Paul had evangelized the empire. And all during these 20 years, he had a dream, and that was to go to Rome. Here he is writing to the Christians in Rome. And he wanted to see them. In fact, if you turn back to chapter 1, right at the start of this great letter, in chapter 1 and verse 8. <coughs> He says, chapter 1 and 8, first, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for all of you because your faith is proclaimed in all the world. For God is my witness, whom I serve with my spirit in the gospel of his Son, that without ceasing I mention you always in my prayers. This is what he's praying for, verse 10. Asking that somehow by God's will, I may now at last succeed in coming to you at Rome, for I long to see you, the Roman Christians, that I may impart to you some spiritual gift to strengthen you, that is, that we may be mutually encouraged by each other's faith, both yours and mine. I want you to know, brothers, that I've often intended to come to you, but so far have been prevented in order that I may reap some harvest amongst you as well as amongst the rest of the Gentiles. So he wanted to go to Rome. But before he went to Rome, he had to go to Jerusalem because he was carrying in his possession a bag of money. It was the collection for the poor saints in Jerusalem. And what was happening was this. That the Gentile Christians rescued from the darkness and the paganism and the alienation of Rome were saying thank you with money to the Jewish Christians who had first sent out the gospel of salvation. This bag of money was a kind of thank you to the Jews in the Holy Land for the message of Jesus Christ. 
And you know that collection is one of the most co- important collections in the world. It's mentioned several times in the New Testament. You find it in 1 Corinthians chapter 16. You find it in uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 8 and uh, chapter 9. And it was more than just a collection. It was more than the Gentiles saying thank you to the Jews for the gospel. It was this. It was the seal of God on 20 years of evangelical ministry. A life lived under the sovereignty and the overruling of God. You see, Paul had given these 20 years to evangelism. He was always on the move. He very rarely stayed any length of time in one place. He stayed long enough to see a handful of people coming to Christ and then he established them in the faith and then he was up and on and out into the darkness. As one of the Christian commentators says, he was like a bleeding hare running through the snow in the winter time. And you could trace him by the blood. And that bag of money was God honoring 20 years of evangelical ministry. And uh, that's why in verse um, 16, Paul uses the language of uh, worship. If you turn to verse uh, 16 again, he speaks at the end of verse 15 of the special grace given to me by God to be a liturgical minister of Christ Jesus to the Gentiles in the priestly service of the gospel of God so that the sacrificial offering of the Gentiles may be acceptable, sanctified by the Holy Spirit. And in verse 31, he prays, asks for prayer, (coughs) verse 31, that he may be delivered from the unbelieving Jews in Judea that my liturgical service for Jerusalem. That's the bag of money. A very grand name to give filthy lucre. Dirty money. Paul says, it is a liturgical service. It's a worshipful thing. And it's God honoring 20 years of ministry lived underneath the sovereignty of God. Verse 31, so that my liturgical service for Jerusalem may be acceptable to the saints, so that by God's will, once I've been to Jerusalem, I may come to you in Rome with joy and be refreshed in your company. <laughs> But how he came to Rome is one of the marvels of God's providence. You see, he went to Jerusalem with the money. Surely you know what happened there. Well, you see, the church of Jerusalem had changed. It had gone all narrow-minded and inward-looking and restricted. And James, the bishop of the church, wasn't terribly sure about this chap, Paul, coming in from the darkness. Perhaps he'd been contaminated by the Gentiles. So he asked Paul to take a Jewish vow, just to please the Jews and the narrow-minded people in Jerusalem. And Paul 
who was always willing to become a Jew to win the Jews and a Gentile to win the Gentiles and an outsider to win the outsiders and an insider to win the insiders said, all right, I'll take your Jewish vow. I'll take this vow from the law of Moses. I'll go back to the Old Testament if it'll do you any good. And he went to the temple to consecrate himself in the vow and he was spotted in the temple by unbelieving Jews and they said that's the man that's destroying the Jewish faith he's taken our Bible away from us the Romans were sent for Paul was arrested for a breach of the peace he was taken to trial and in the middle of the trial he shouted I appeal to Caesar he might just as well have said give me a single fare to Rome a single ticket to Rome please because once you say, I appeal to Caesar, you have to go to Rome. To a higher court. My friend, it's one of the most amusing things in the Bible. That it was the emperor of Rome who paid Paul's fare to go to Rome to preach the gospel. Mercy. Who taught Moses to write? It was Pharaoh. And the hand of Moses wrought about Pharaoh's destruction. You see, do you want to be where God wants you to be? Doing what God wants you to do in the way in which God wants you to do it. If you want to live like that under God's overruling, my friend, be prepared for surprises. William C. Burns in 1820 wanted to evangelize Scotland, but God sent him to China. Amy Carmichael wanted to evangelize Japan, but God sent her to India and made her an invalid into the bargain. And for 20 years, she could hardly move. They were the best years of our life. Oh, if you want to be where God wants you to be, doing what God wants you to do in the way in which God wants you to do it, underneath His sovereignty, Be prepared for surprises. Paul wanted to go to Rome. He didn't know that the emperor was going to pay his fare. And the second thing is this. If you want to be where God it wants to lead you, you must also prepare for surprises. You see, Paul finished up... <coughs> as a minister to the Gentiles. And Peter, his colleague, finished up as a minister to the Jews. You see, from the very start, God had decided there was to be a difference between Peter and Paul in their ministries. Peter was to go to the Jews. And Paul was to go to the Gentiles. But you see, naturally speaking, that isn't what you would have expected. It would have been more sensible to send Paul to the Jews. After all, he was fond of boasting about his religious pedigree. In Philippians 2, 3, a Hebrew born of Hebrew parents 
from the tribe of Benjamin, circumcised on the eighth day according to the law of Moses, blameless in the law of God, a Pharisee of the Pharisees. What better man to send to the Jews? And as for Peter, what better man to send to the Gentiles? After all, it was Peter who had the vision on the rooftop at Joppa, the sheet and the unclean animals coming down from heaven. He wouldn't eat the animals. God said, rise and eat. Peter said, I can't eat these beasts. They would make me ritually un unclean. They're forbidden in the book of Leviticus. I can't eat these beasts. God said, let no man call unclean what I have called clean. Rise and eat. And the message to Peter on the rooftop was that the unclean Gentiles were to come into the kingdom of God and be saved and pardoned and redeemed. What better man to send to the Gentiles than Peter? But Peter was sent to the Jews. And Paul was sent to the Gentiles. You know, this is where the Roman Catholic Church is very wrong when it says that Peter was the first bishop of Rome. It should have been Paul who was the first bishop of Rome, as if he would have wanted such a thing. Because Paul was sent to the outsiders. The lines were crossed. He is a chosen vessel unto me, to carry my name before the Gentiles. To me, he says in Ephesians 3, has this special grace been given that I should preach amongst the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of um, Christ. Are you prepared for surprises as to where God will send you? How could I ever have known I was coming to Inverness? Four years before I came here, I had a holiday in Inverness and lived in a bed and breakfast place in Mid Mills Road and walked up Crown Drive one evening and saw this garden overrun with weeds Dorothy Perkin roses, Mrs. Sutherland's lovely ramblers gone to seed. What a mess. Dirty windows. As I passed number 52, I thought, mercy, what a mess of a house. I wonder who lives there. Well, well. Are you prepared to live your life under God's sovereignty? Are you ready to make yourself available to him and to his overruling and leading as to how he will lead you and where he will take you? There's one last challenge. And with it we close. Verses 19 and 20. He says, At the end of verse 19, I have fully preached the gospel of Christ, thus making it my ambition to preach the gospel not where Christ has already been named, lest I should build on another man's foundation. Paul did not go where someone else had been. He was a church planter, he laid foundations. Other men came along and built on the foundations. But the basics were done by Paul. What Paul loved was new ground. He loved virgin soil. He loved ground that had been unexplored for Jesus and the gospel. And it was on that kind of soil that he did something heroic for Christ. 
That's a challenge to you all this morning. To do something heroic for Christ. I love pagans. I love speaking to people about Christ. To people from no religious background. They, they can't answer back to you about hymns and ministers and religion and pews and traditions. I love new ground. I love virgin soil. Ground that has been unexplored for Christ and the gospel. Would you like to do something for Christ? Would you like to do something heroic for Christ? My friend, new ground all around you virgin soil it's all around you unexplored territory it's all around you and Stephen Anderson was here five years ago he and his team were stoned at an open-air meeting in Inverness. The Bibles they handed to the children were torn into shreds. Will you rise up and do something heroic for Christ? The fallow ground is there. The virgin soil is there. Rise up, my Christian friend, and in the name of God, challenge the darkness as Paul challenged the darkness of that lost, benighted Roman world. Challenge the darkness in the name of God. Strike out for Jesus. Do something heroic for him. Above all, be prepared for surprises. Amen. May God add a blessing to his word.